Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers in a minute. But before that, let me just say how pleased and honored we are at NTU uh, to be able to co-organize today's seminar as part of the Global Health Histories Seminar Series uh, run by WHO in conjunction with the University of York under the directorship of Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya. Uh, so today's seminars are uh, one in a series of uh, seminars that Sanjoy and others have organized for WHO uh, in the broad area of uh, public health, health history, and medical history. Uh, we have picked uh, the topic of infectious diseases today for obvious reasons, its importance, its topicality, and relevance to Singapore and the region. Uh, of course, Singapore can be very proud for its many accomplishments over the years in containing uh, many of our infectious diseases, uh, keeping the levels down to a very low level. Uh, but at the same time, there are challenges facing us still. For example, uh, Dengue fever is still a major concern. Uh, so together with our, uh, our medical colleagues, uh, we would like to work towards better uh, solutions to these problems. And from the humanities uh, side and from our perspective, there are contributions that we are pleased to make from anthropology, from public health studies, from humanities, history, and literature even, because there's narrative medicine, which is a very strong field of research these days. Uh, and uh, before I uh, open the seminar today, let me just uh, fill in a bit of background. In NTU, uh, in the School of Humanities, we have set up, uh, we set up about two years ago, a, C, uh, 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 sorry, a research cluster called the Medical Humanities Research Cluster, which consists not only of faculty within the humanities, from history, literature, and linguistics, and communications, and so on, but also colleagues from Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine, uh, and also partners in the hospitals and clinics and the uh, healthcare organizations and uh, authorities in Singapore. For example, the uh, National Healthcare is one of our partners. Uh, and together we are pursuing research grants, we're carrying out uh, research projects and trying to make our findings and uh, uh, results of relevance and uh, useful to the uh, authorities. <clears throat> so with that background, let me turn back to today's seminar and first of all, uh, introduce the speakers to you. Uh, we have three speakers this morning. Uh, first one would be Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya, as I already said. Uh, Sanjoy is Professor of History and Medicine at the University of York. He's also the head of the WHO Collaborative, Collaborative Center for Global Health Histories, and also the Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator of a Wellcome Trust funded project. Uh, he's widely extensively published in this view and is very well experienced in the uh, organization of these seminars. Our second speaker will be Professor Maidun. Uh, she's professor at the uh, Wikimedia Wee School of Communication and Information uh, at NTU, also associate dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Uh, professor Lin's research covers a wide field of uh, areas, including public health and medical uh, education medical communication. Our third speaker will be uh, Assistant Professor Ivy Ian. Uh, Ivy is one of our faculty in the school specializing in biological anthropology and medical anthropology. She's also done some work in the archaeological uh, side of uh, the research. So she'll be reporting to us a different perspective on the study of infectious diseases. So without Further ado, let me invite first Sanjoy, Professor Bhattacharya, to give his 
presentation. Sancho. I'm an Apple Mac person, so. So thank you, Professor Liu, for collaborating with us on this, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so uh, to very quickly say that the WHO Global Health Histories Initiative is deeply interdisciplinary in nature. We work together uh, across disciplines, trying to break down silos. And it is not a monopoly of the University of York. Uh, so in this instance, we are not the organizers, NTU is. And we are honored uh, to contribute in small ways to organizing this. So the, this event is down to Nanya Technological University and its academic and administrative strengths. Um, we have two experts from two disciplines speaking about infectious disease. Uh, uh, so I am going to speak uh, not as long as them. I'm going to just set up uh, the history of infectious disease uh, control programs within the World Health Organization. Uh, but as I do so, I'm not going to bore you with facts of then different departments were set up in the WHO. But I, my aim is to <coughs> conceptually uh, challenge uh, all of you into understanding the complexities of the WHO that have always been there, but are often not spoken about. Um, uh, when I have presented on these themes, we also work with WHO interns. We, offer, we go in, we work with national government officials. We often run into disciplinary and training sessions uh, for government officials in medical humanities and social sciences. And there, of course, you know, we, what we don't want to do is teach people historical methods, but we, what we want them to do is to think in complex ways about organization so that they understand what the complexities of implementation of policy are. And that is in infectious disease the crux, isn't it? I mean, when you have to control infectious disease, you have to get your preparation in relation to implementation, which is the most complex uh, bit of the response. Perfect. It has to be socially, politically, economically prepared for a major problem. So, the, the WHO uh, was conceptualized uh, 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 through a new constitution in the summer of 1946 in a massive meeting in New York. At this meeting, uh, the United States government was the host. But it was also attended by uh, members of the Wartam Alliance. This, the WHO was any, in many ways uh, 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 the culmination of the Allied victory during the Second World War. So at this meeting, Britain, France were also involved. And, and they played important roles in imagining what this new World Health Organization was going to look like. Canada was also a major player. On the 7th of April 1948, the WHO officially came into existence when the necessary 27 uh, countries ratified the constitution. Now this was an important moment. Amongst those 27 who ratified the constitution, included countries that had just become independent from European colonial rule. So I'd like to point out to you that from the very beginning, something new was being thrown into the mix. A new post-war vision was being thrown into the mix. This was not the League of Nations. Often in lazy histories, or lazy institutional histories, or lazy academic histories, and both exist, you will find a linear explanation of how the WHO comes into being. And in that linear explanation, 
They say that, oh, the League of Nations and the health section basically transformed into the WHO after the Second World War. So I am arguing to you here today, that is not what happened. Most of the people who work at the League suddenly found that they would not have jobs in the new WHO. And they moved to what would become the United Nations Organization for Children's Welfare, UNICEF. Whereas WHO, if you look at the departments, and especially look at the topic today, the infection diseases department, the departments formed with new kinds of leadership, often leadership that was involved in the Second World War, in scientific research, in malaria, for example, or other infectious diseases. So the new WHO has more links with the Second World War's scientific research and the newly independent countries pushing their own experts into this new organization rather than the old League of Nations health uh, section. Now that's the picture outside the UN Palais. Those of you, I'm sure a lot of you have been to Geneva and seen the beautiful Palais building. The, the members of the first World Health Assembly which, which included delegates and observers from more than 70 countries. Now here we have to remember that when we talk about countries, many of these were actually not countries. They were protectorates, some were still uh, colonies, uh, but they were being called countries <clears throat> because this was a historical moment when it, empire had actually become a dirty word. America was pressuring European powers to give up their empire. The European powers suspected that the United States really wanted the markets in what used to be their empire, so there was behind the scenes suspicion. But the point remains is that the word empire becomes dirty. And therefore, there's always talk about nations and countries contributing to both the WHO's formation and the first World Health Assembly. So this is conceptually, I argue, to all of you, important. So what were the six priorities of the first World Health Assembly? The first World Health Assembly identified six major priorities, malaria control, maternal and child health, TB control, venereal diseases control, environmental sanitation, and nutrition. Now why is this important, apart from the fact that this is a very impressive list? This is important because the World Health Organization inaugurated a new process of deciding what was important. All the countries who were represented formally in the World Health Assembly had a vote. These priorities were actually decided by a vote. So if you break down each of these categories and look at the voting patterns, you can see which countries were supporting each of these priorities. This was post-war international governance democracy in a completely new way. It was a post-war international governance democratic structure that often annoyed the representatives of the old imperial powers who were used to just ordering people to do what they thought was important. This was the first time Britain had to scrabble around, or Britain's representatives had to scrabble around for support to get nutrition on the agenda. Because Britain was playing an important research leadership role in nutrition. They wanted nutrition to be there. In fact, the first director general of the food, FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization, was one of the big British sort of actors. Uh, in research. So Britain wanted nutrition uh, uh, on the agenda, but had to make sure that it had enough support by vote, by country, so that there was a majority vote in support of nutrition. Now, as many historians have pointed out, and of course the institutional history has pointed out, that's a picture from Nepal, spraying, DDT spraying in Nepal. Malaria <coughs> control and eradication got a lot of money, both from poor budgets and special projects. Here was another innovation that I want you to keep in mind. You know, we often talk about WHO doing big things. How do they fund? It's not an endless amount of money. There's a finite budget. How are decisions made? 
often we don't think about this. We just assume the money is there and the money is being used in unproblematic ways. But it wasn't. So when you do the boring thing of following the money, and this is where economic history comes into play, you start seeing the politics of economics. It is politics. There is a core budget, and there's a fight for the core budget. How is the core budget funded? The core budget is funded not by one country, but contributions of all member states. The moment all member states contribute, and how do they contribute? <coughs> through your taxes, through our taxes to the taxes of citizens then. It becomes an audited budget. So this is not an imperial budget, for instance, how the First World War was fought by Britain, but it could just suck in resources from the Indian taxpayer and not be answerable to anyone. This was more like the Second World War, that when Britain wanted to suck in resources from what was British India to fight the war, it had to create detailed accounts and at the end of the war repay that money to the independent nations of Pakistan and India. WHO equally, unlike the League of Nations, was funded by poor budgets, paid for by taxpayer dollars, which it had to audit and account for. But, very importantly, there was also the special project budget, where individual countries could support individual pet projects. And as historians, we have to study that money as well. Because if you only study the core budget, then we only get part of the picture. But if you study the special projects, the money, and follow that money, you start seeing how the US is pushing for malaria, how the US, um, the United Kingdom is pushing for nutrition, and how, I will discuss in the next slide, India, a newly independent country, wanting to be muscular internationally and regionally, is pushing for TV. And this is what I mean by not the only game in town. If we have a Eurocentric or a US centric approach to the study of international health governance, and we only follow the money that the American government gives, its special project and its core project funds, we, we will come out of that study session thinking, okay, malaria eradication was the most important thing for WHO. But that wasn't the case. If you go the other way, where you look from the top and then start saying, okay, where's WHO getting the money? And then you start following the various sources of money. You realize that there are other programs in relation to infectious diseases that were also important at the same time as malaria that were receiving significant funding and which left an impact on all levels of WHO and national governments. So TB control. So TB control was internationally important after the Second World War. After the liberation of the concentration camps and the displacements of millions of people in, in Central and Eastern Europe, as, as, as uh, the concentration camps were liberated, huge numbers of people were liberated, but had nowhere to go to. Amongst those people who were severely malnourished, you had people from British Nutritional Services trying to improve their nutritional status, but you also had infectious disease. You had typhus, you had TB. TB was a European problem in the immediate post-war era. So historians like Niels Brimnes, who have written the most brilliant recent work on the history of international TB control. I think the book is called Languished Hopes. Niels Brimness is in August University in Denmark. So what he has suggested in several talks I've attended is that in a country like Denmark, there was shame in the post-war government that parts of Danish government had collaborated with Nazi Germany. So what happens after the war is that when a pro-allied, pro-US government comes to power after the Second World War, they want to make an international statement by contributing huge sums of money towards something that helps the world to make up for that shame. They want to get rid of the wartime collaboration shame with the Nazis 
by throwing a huge amount of resources into international TV control. So that assistance goes out globally. It goes out into sort of the massive refugee populations that are being resettled in Europe, but also goes into Asia and Africa. Africa turns out more difficult for the Danes because Africa is still empire, largely. Asia, or parts of Asia that were getting independent, were actually more open to collaboration with the Danish international agencies who were working, importantly, in conjunction with WHO to control tuberculosis. And, and they're open because A, they of course admit there's a problem with TV, TV exists, but B, the new governments also needed to demonstrate to their populations that they were doing something new that the previous colonial governments had not done for them. So disease, infectious disease control is a very important part of new nationalist governments trying to show that they cared and they could make a difference that previous colonial governments could not do. It was also at a, in a hidden level, if you look at the confidential correspondence between UNICEF, WHO, Danish aid programs, the NIDA, and the Indian government, an ambition that through these programs, countries like India would get technological independence, the capability to create vaccine, the capability to actually start producing DDT inside India, the capability to start producing antibiotics, basically ensuring there was independence and non-dependence on the US and Western Europe, or indeed Eastern Europe, the USSR. So what we have to remember when we look at the TV program is that there were national and local contributions as well. Why do I highlight this? Often when historians of international and global health look at contributions, they only look at what WHO has given and what these special project funds have given. So we then artificially create a narrative of dependence. We artificially create a narrative of international aid into the dark corners of the world. We don't say it that way, but that's what we are saying. But if you start counting national staff who are involved in these programs and actually do the boring sit down and do the boring addition with the calculator and start looking at staff salaries, infrastructure, you actually realize that national and local contributions, which are also coming from additional taxpayers' money, are often maybe not as high, but significantly high. And then you get a different picture. It becomes a truly collaborative effort. It becomes a truly international effort in infectious disease control. So this is what I mean by challenging you conceptually. You know, where we presume the money comes from, how we calculate, all determines the history we write of the recent past. So final slide. So that is from Indonesia, public broadcasting. So what was this talk about? So I have tried to conceptually challenge you, all of you, by talking about the post-World War consensus, World War II consensus in new ways. We have to remember that there was a new world order. The WHO is a product of that new world order. Nations were elected to the executive board for actual administration of WHO programs. It wasn't assumed that certain countries automatically had international leadership. There was an election. The League of Nations Health Section basically on its board had the most powerful imperial nations. Here, that was not the case. So what countries were represented in the first executive board of the WHO? Australia with its ambitions to control what is now 
the Western Pacific Regional Office re area, <coughs> Brazil, very important player in the Americas. You know, people assume that only America was the big player in the Americas. Belarusia, Soviet, so Soviet Socialist Republic, Ceylon. People forget that Ceylon was the model colony in South Asia with tremendous health indicators. Successive director generals of the WHO, whenever they want evidence that a project works, they go and collect evidence from Ceylon to show that, look, primary health care is a good idea, look at Ceylon, you know, tremendous, it's small, so it gets overshadowed by India, people only talk about Kerala, but what Kerala has now, Ceylon has had since the interwar years, the British called it the model colony, China, what does China mean, of course China here means Taiwan, because it's the Kuomintang government, uh, uh, and in fact, the first regional director of the Western Pacific Regional Office comes from what then becomes Taiwan. Uh, Egypt, France, India, Iran. Iran is a major player. Mexico, another big American player which doesn't get studied. Netherlands, Norway, Poland, United, uh, USSR, UK, US, and Yugoslavia. So, this is truly a different international uh, context. Very important, who was the powerful chair? The chair of the WH Executive Board has a lot of power. This is striking. Who was elected by the nations to chair the Executive Board? An Egyptian leader. Again, a name that has sort of disappeared into the vapors, into the mist. So someone who played an enormous role in designing, expanding the agreements, international agreements that underpinned um, uh, the, the new WHO. It was Sir Ali Tafik, Susha Pasha of Egypt, who would go on to become the first regional director of the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, then in Alexandria, it's now in Cairo. Why am I pointing this out to you? Because as the WHO grew, it grew by creating some very powerful regional offices in which newly independent countries played a prominent role. So if we have to study infectious diseases control, we cannot just study the headquarters in Geneva. We have to study the regional offices as well. For the regional offices, if you look at the regional offices papers, infectious disease was the, at the heart of their work which is why I think today's papers are so important. Because they draw on data from the region for the region. Historically, whatever WJ headquarters might say, the Director General's office has always been open about the fact that the regions are important and data from the regions is important. And therefore, I would argue to you today that the data we are about to hear today is important to the WHO because it is so important to the regional level of the WHO. Policy is bottom up, not top down. Some WHO leaders may have pretended it was top down, but those who did so too vigorously landed up with egg on their face because it didn't work. Malaria eradication failed. When high-profile projects were allowed to be bottomed up, they were smallpox eradication. But that's another topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. May I move straight on to the other two speakers? And then after that, I'll invite uh, Nikki, Nikki to give a summary and to give some comments. So very good morning to everyone, and thank you very much to Kiki and Sanjoy for inviting me, and uh, Nikki for coming to be our uh, moderator. Um, I am a health communication scholar from the Wikimedia School of Communication Information. So when I was asked to uh, be at this talk, I tried to structure my talk in as historical a manner as possible. So it is a very brief history 
kind of narrating um, some of my experiences and trying to show um, participatory health surveillance uh, in a historical context. So I'm going to, to share with you about uh, participatory health surveillance, an area I've been uh, involved in for the past uh, 15 years or so. And then I'll talk about influenza at large, and then um, narrowing down to some of my vector work. We'll go back to influenza, um, narrowing in on the specific work we've done in Singapore, and then look at some of the um, learning opportunities and experiences um, in my work. So, um, participatory health surveillance is um, a newish area in the uh, in, in surveillance history. And it's a little bit different from kind of utilizing uh, big data, you know, for um, uh, analytical and predictive purposes. Uh, the uh, Max Smolenisky and his team uh, had this definition. They talked about the collection of data for public health action by directly involving the population at risk in submitting relevant data through a variety of survey tools. A pretty new definition from 2017, uh, which which really uh, you know um, has the component of public participating actively in providing information. So in that aspect, it's a little bit different from um, a, a lot of uh, researchers who've looked at you know the utilization of big data that's available uh, in the online space and then trying to look at trends and coming up with analytics and so on. The component of the public participating actively uh, in this endeavor is key in participatory health surveillance and that kind of underpins uh, you know, what's, what's happened in, in this space. So there's a lot of activities uh, throughout the world and uh, you know, really in, in almost every uh, continent we have participatory health surveillance happening in the infectious um, disease space uh, today. There's been uh, many smaller sub-projects at the community level that's um, kind of risen, stopped or failed, but these are some of the big ones um, that, that have been in the academic landscape. So, um, you know, in, in kind of doing this work, we um, looked at many of the uh, apps and websites and um, uh, digital uh, initiatives that have sprung up and one of the things that we notice is that there's been very, very little um, academic work, evidence-based uh, analytics um, that have um, really tried to, to, to um, look at the benefits of uh, each of the programs. But, uh, you know, and, and, and so many of the work uh, have not been documented. I think a, 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 a researcher in LKC Medicine who's been looking at the diabetes space, for example, he found something like, 800 plus apps available uh, for diabetes patients, but only one or two have been, uh, you know, clinically trialed and assessed. So that's kind of the the um, gap that we're talking about here. So uh, when we look at the short uh, timeline, uh, this is, uh, you know, th this is how um, the, the timeline um, span. Um, what happened was that in uh, Europe. Australia and the US kind of organically researchers and groups were coming up with ways to track flu through participatory surveillance asking people to update information every week or every two weeks and then using that information to predict where um, the uh, flu virus was going and what some of the trends were in their regions were. So this started in, in these um, different areas and I put down these three, influenza, net flu, tracking, and flu near you, because they are still in existence today. Uh, Australia takes the honor of having the only uh, surveillance that has been uninterrupted. Some of the others, they kind of stopped for a while, and then they were relaunched, and so on. But uh, Australia has been going strong since 2006, so it is the oldest participatory surveillance system that is um, uh, used at a major scale um, uh, in a country. I also put down uh, Google Flu Trends because, you know, kind of showing this type of landscape, some of you may have heard of this and you might be kind of interested to see how this fits in the timeline. Google uh, Flu Trends, of course, is not participatory surveillance, but it, it made a big splash because, you know, many people thought that all the information that people type in regarding the flu 
would be something that would be useful in prediction. And so there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of interest in that space. But in 2015, it stopped. Uh, it was not able to predict flu in the same way that participatory surveillance could. And so that, that happened between 2008 and 2015. I started work in this area around 2010, 2011, uh, doing research. And you know, as Sanjoy has mentioned, um, the, the kind of key area, malaria, uh, was what we were looking at first. And we found that, you know, um, uh, uh, we, 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 were, we went to five countries and we did a whole bunch of studies, uh, ethnographic as well as quantitative um, studies, and we found that many of the populations and many of the governments were struggling not much uh, with malaria, but with dengue, which was, uh, you know, rife in many of the urban centers. And so, uh, and at that time, kind of almost without knowing this whole landscape, uh, we took a plunge and developed a MOBAS, which was the first participatory surveillance for better. And that's how I got involved in this space. And uh, MOBAS is going strong. We now are going to launch uh, MOBAS uh, Part 2 in Sri Lanka soon. And then uh, in between 2013 and 2016, a whole bunch of participatory surveillance have been launched, including the, the Kidanga um, in the US for better as well and then kind of uh, One Health systems in Thailand and Cambodia. And then I myself have been coming back to influenza and having been involved in flu mob and flu tech in Singapore. So that's where the coming back to influenza story uh, would unfold. So if you, you kind of see that, these are the, the triad of the, the biggies in the influenza space. And then um, the work that I've been involved in personally, MOBAS, uh, flu mob, and, and uh, the Mobus part two. So um, just a little bit on um, on the on the, the biggies. Um, if we look at uh, flu tracking in Australia, it's really really impressive because right now they have got close to fifty thousand responses every week. So people down uh, sorry them they, they don't download. They go to a website. They go to a website um, in in uh, Australia. It is run by Hunter Medical Research Institute in uh, Newcastle, and then um, they sign up for this at the beginning of the flu season, and every week they just have to answer if they have got any of the 19 symptoms of influenza. And if they are found to have two or more, then it, it places some kind of alert, there is kind of an algorithm going on back there. And uh, really many research papers have come out of this team, led by Craig Delton, and um, it's been shown to be pretty effective compared to many of the traditional methods which waits until the patient is in the uh, hospital before the uh, information is, uh, is utilized for prediction. It's uh, recently uh, expanded to New Zealand and there are already 6,000 registered users in New Zealand. So, um, so, it, so, so it is a system that we, we get a lot of inspiration from. And you can see some of the numbers. Uh, I won't go into the details because uh, I'm you know, trying to show a lot of items, but you can see that they have a lot of data that's um, tracked um, over um, all that time since um, the beginning of their work. Uh, influenza net is interesting, uh, especially for Asia, because it is a collaboration of many different countries. Unlike Australia, it's not one central government body that's looking at the data, but you've got a number of countries utilizing the same platform and then sharing information. So this makes it um, very interesting. And so that's uh, run in the EU plus UK. And then in the US, they've got Flu Near You, and they've got about 30,000 uh, weekly reports. And it's, uh, it's run by Andy Pandemics and the Boston Children's Hospital. So, so these three have been um, active in the market. Sometimes, uh, you know, with the involvement of these three parties, there have been ad hoc systems. And notable in particular is the system that was launched for the Rio Olympics 2016. So you've got thousands of people converging in Rio. And then, you know, from the beginning of their, um, their, their arrival in Rio till the end of, um, uh, till their departure, each of the visitors was asked to, to um, submit information if they have got any symptoms. And so that was to, uh, and if you remember, kind of at the, that time, 
um, Zika was first on the horizon, so there was a lot of fear um, of, of an outbreak happening during the Rio Olympics. So, so that's that's what's happening in the world, and so you know, so and then for my work, digital designing surveillance in Asia, I call it mobiles and soil milk. I'll tell you about the soil milk <laughs> a little bit, um, but you know. Um, in, in, in 2010 or so, I was working with the Cosmic uh, Center for Research uh, in Social Media for Communities. And one of the things that we were re realizing is that, you know, there was this boom in the number of uh, mobile phones that were being utilized across Asia. Now, those three systems that we saw, they were based on, on a web platform. Most of the Europeans and Americans, when they went to uh, report, you know, any of these symptoms, it was usually happening through their laptops. But in Asia, we found that you know there was this increasing mobile penetration, and you might be interested to see that this number was like less than five percent in some of the Asian countries as recently as 2010, and suddenly you've got 72 percent. Now, at the same time. If you look at some of the uh, figures, for example, like internet usage, uh, use of laptops, it wasn't increasing a lot. It was just the mobile phones. Today, you can see that that penetration, the 72%, has busted the 100%. In majority of Asian countries, you've got large numbers of mobile penetration. So, so at that time, kind of without knowing the landscape, you know, we thought that it would be good to look at, so we went back to the malaria issue, look at vector and see how we could use mobile phones to tackle the vector efforts in different countries. And we visited many different countries, but now listening to Sanjoy's literature, I now understand why you know, serendipity happened in Sri Lanka. I didn't know that it was kind of a model uh, country where, where uh, health systems were concerned. So when we went there, we tried to kind of set this up. Everything worked so well. You know, the municipal council, the hospitals, the university kind of all had this link. And in some of the other countries, we didn't. So we were trying this with four other countries. But it only happened in Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, at the Kunampo Municipal Council, uh, the head office, they had these big charts you know, bigger than this room, two or three stories high. And there were people who were employed to do nothing but put pins every day. I'm a pin person, you know. Red for uh, hot zones, uh, blue for, you know, warm zones and, and so on. So every day they would change this. And so we thought that, hey, you know, maybe we got information, then we could see, show where the hot spots were. Uh, you know, it would be a lot faster than somebody coming in from the field, filing uh, paper, materials, you know, uh, then doing this hot zone, which is actually three days later, mosquitoes would have gone away and so on. So we wanted to just kind of shorten this, this time span. If we got all the information, then we could aggregate it uh, very fast. There was also the need for surveillance. How do uh, people and, and, um, and, and uh, inspectors go to do surveillance uh, across uh, much of the Kolambo landscape? They go there, they take a picture, and then they bring it back, they print it out, and then they file it. So there was also that lag time in the surveillance. So we thought, hey, you know, you've got the mobile phones, why don't you take a picture and send it by Facebook or WhatsApp or something like that. And they were using, so this is, is really my primary area, they were using all this outmoded health communication materials, probably from 1948, because they were part of the, the surveillance network. And, um, you know, they were really, really old in look and feel and, and so on. And, and the uh, inspectors had to bring many, many of these copies and give it out when there was a, 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 an outbreak. So we thought that these were the, the issues that needed to be resolved and developed MOBAS, a system to do dynamic disease mapping, civic uh, engagement. Uh, you can just take a picture, upload the information, and then you've got online digital materials to, um, to, to do health communication. And you know some of this includes um, video type of pictures where information could be shared and, and shown um, throughout. And really, this was the effort uh, in NTU uh, that was multidisciplinary. We had behavioral scientists, health communication experts, computer scientists, uh, mathematics, uh, clinicians, and so on. So um, MOBAS was born, and that um, uh, really had an impact on what happened in uh, Dengue situation. 
In 2015, March, we launched, and you can see the, 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 the difference in number between 2014 and 2015 in terms of the dengue incidence numbers. And we're talking about, you know, um, uh, 30, 40,000 people um, in Colombo itself that were being in, in, impacted, but dengue cases came down. It's actually a long story how we got to mobile space too from there, but um, this was how I kind of uh, came to be connected with the uh, the, the uh, digital um, uh, participatory surveillance landscape and kind of taking uh, a lot of the knowledge and ideas um, eventually, uh, which included a big epi hack in Sri Lanka. So I'll just pass this around. Um, uh, we this was the uh, the route to Tencent. Yeah, thank you. So kind of taking some of the best practices in health biospatry surveillance, we've now um, developed uh, MOBAS 2, which will be launched um, early next year in Sri Lanka. So then we come back to the Singapore space, right? And in Singapore, the, um, uh, the issue, okay, I'll, I'll just skip forward to this one uh, in a bit and go back. So in Singapore, the issue, uh, dengue is a very, very important concern for Singapore, um, but uh, Singapore's number one um, uh, you know, enemy in the infectious disease space has often been influenza. And Singapore was hit very, very hard by the SARS of 2003. I remember uh, being a young professor in uh, NUS, and I was um, invigilating exams. And we were very, very nervous. We had to do the exams because that was like critical. But we were asked to sit like five, five persons apart. And then even the papers, you know, we had to put on gloves and so on to collect the papers and so on. It was really, really a, a, a very nerve-wracking time. And so if we kind of uh, go back to the history here, very interesting, 12 March 2003, WHO issued uh, an alert for SARS. There were, the next day, there were already multiple six staff, staff in Tan Tock Seng Hospital. Singapore had, you know, huge numbers of uh, people who were infected, and uh, Tan Tock Seng was the ground zero. And the six, six staff uh, uh, were isolated and so on, but it was only many days later that there was staff fever surveillance, and the gloves and the N95 mask were only given up a few days later. It was actually this, this long hair. So the question in the Singapore space is, could participatory surveillance or something like that prevent this type of scenario from happening? Could we try to make earlier predictions, right? And so with that in mind, and then taking the uh, learning experiences from the three uh, uh, participatory surveillance um, systems across the world, we developed a flu mob first, and then uh, flu tech. Flu mob is especially for healthcare workers, and uh, for a year, for the past year, we have tested it in the Doxing Hospital and the KK Hospitals. And not KK's hospital, but the, <laughs> the KK Hospital, uh, uh, which is a women's hospital in Singapore. And um, we, we took it one step further because it was in a hospital environment from the traditional systems which is that if you have some of the combination of the symptoms, you would be asked to do a nasal or a, a nasal swab or a blood test so that we have those samples as well. And we were able to kind of uh, triangulate with um, more data. We um, also did a pilot test of uh, students at MTU and working adults. Um, and this system is, is called um, FluTech. So, um, so that work had been done and uh, you might be quite interested to see, like when we first launched uh, the project, you know, and then we say that we've got this app, you know, please download it. Um, usually, maybe let's say we've got 100 people downloading, usually after a few weeks, it's about 60% who maintain. So that's where the soy milk comes in, because we're like, how do we incentivize without spending too much money? How do we? So we say that, okay, if you, you know, uh, report 10 times, we'll give you a cup of soy milk at Mr. Bean. Yeah. <laughs> And that works really well. So mm. the incentive does not need to be huge, you know. I mean, we could work out like I think with Mr. B, maybe like 
$1.20, you know, and so it's about 10 cents, so this little bit of incentive goes a long way uh, in the Singapore context. So, uh, so, so that's kind of like a uh, brief history of what I've been doing and what, uh, what's been happening in the participatory surveillance space. And um, uh, more importantly, the, the question is kind of the learning experiences um, and, you know, and, and what might be the potential for the future. Um, we did find in our work that um, sometimes acceptance of new technologies, especially something like uh, you know, MOBAS, which really kind of requires a new way of doing things, could be pretty slow. In using MOBAS with um, health inspectors, for example, you've got uh, you know, 20 or 30%, which is the digital natives and so on, who are quick to use. And then you've got the next group, and then the last 30%, like they would resist. They would be like, I'm a health inspector, I want my paper on my desk, I want all those, you know, they feel comfortable. And so um, it was it was really kind of an interesting journey how to get you know, more people to use. Um, but eventually when they use and they, they find that how easy it is to use, they are eventually positive. Um, ensuring data privacy and security is, is a huge and important issue and is becoming more important especially with um, recent cases in Singapore. And that is uh, uh, where I think the private-public partnership will be really important. We always try to work with uh, the telcos. Um, in the case of um, Sri Lanka, we were, were quite lucky to be able to have the support of Mobitel. But in any country, you know, to get um, support from private-public partnerships is, is, is very difficult. And we need that to ensure um, uh, privacy. And then um, the uh, challenges in sustainability. You see, in um, uh, Australia and in the um, United States and Europe, well, they've got a six-month flu period, a uh, flu season. So when it comes to flu season, people are actually alerted. They're like, oh, it's flu season. We better start doing this. We'll download this. We'll do this. You know, as part of community effort, we have flu all year round in Singapore. So what you do is like, oh, it's flu now. OK, now we have the southern strain. Now we have the northern strain. It's flu. You know, so do I keep? You know, and that's where a little bit of, of sawmill came in. But um, um, so we're looking at ways, and you know, and this is really work in progress, very early work. And if any of you have ideas on how to incentivize people, maybe gamification. We were thinking of this, like rewards and, and so on. That that could be um, a, a path to trot in the future. So. Uh, so what does this mean for you know participatory surveillance across the world? What can we do? What are the potential opportunities? Um, one opportunity um, for sure is the geographic link. You know, me as a scholar in Singapore who has both the northern and the southern strain have always been really passionate about trying to bring the northern and the southern together. See, the Australians don't really care after they finish the season. They're like, we'll wait for the next season and the Americans are happy to share their data and pass it down. But in Singapore, we have this, you know, two strains coming in and our vaccines are related to that. So across our region, I've been wanting to try to see how we can, you know, aggregate the data from the north and the south and then consolidate and, and, um, and use big data analytics to, to predict what's going to happen in our part of the world. Uh, another potential consolidation is across different types of platforms both animal and human. So I have talked about a lot of animal systems, but some of the systems that were being developed in, um, in Thailand and so on, they were animal systems with the veterinarians. So, uh, so the idea was, you know, with so much of uh, what's happening across the world, swine flu and so on, going from animal uh, to human and so on, to, to kind of use that as early prediction uh, as well. So that's a possibility. But in all this, um, you know, learning and working across disciplines is supremely important. We are breaking new ground in the way that we do things. I'm not sure whether Sanjay will, will agree with this, but you know, um, the uh, in, in WHO, maybe how they did initiatives in the beginning was really kind of driven by maybe clinicians, policy makers, and so on. And you know, in this space, um, we really needed the uh, assistance of computer scientists, uh, many different types of experts, you know, um, folks from humanities, uh, philosophy to look at ethical uh, components and so on. And we're trying to do this, uh, especially as we move into using new technologies like AI. Um, the, this was the One Health uh, approach, which um, 
as the definition from WHO. But really, uh, that's what we did uh, with the little booklet that I've given around, uh, which is kind of to bring all the experts together, governments, um, doctors, you know, um, um, IT folks, um, and so on, to really come up with um, systems that are going to be user-friendly for both um, scientists and the, the public and to make it um, uh, sustainable in the long run. And you know, it's not just about bringing people and then just having kind of listening to each other, but we really kind of, this went over five days, we really put them into teams where they had to work with one another and then uh, you know, come up with uh, workable solutions. And um, this model was, um, has been shown to be uh, pretty successful so far, we think, and we are hopeful that the new mobiles is going to be um, pretty effective. We're hopeful of that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, let's invite Ivy to give us your presentation.
can reach to nearly uh, three uh, three thousand. So the weather is extremely different here, and this is the map we get in 1934 um, by uh, uh, built by a, a drawback Japanese and this this all uh, written I mean, Japanese world. Okay. So we use GIS to, to GIS to reconstruct all of them. So they are all about forty six uh, police uh, police station uh, along the trail along the line. Okay. So there are some old images. So you can see uh, there. Japanese uh, customs and, and the policemen and their families, wives, and some of the image you can see is really, really uh, the, the landscape is really big. Yeah, this is their uh, the Japanese policemen's lifestyle. Okay. Right. So this image is specifically for this uh, police station that we are we we do the excavation. So we can still find their profile from some of the documents, even their names. So so this family is specific to the, the station. Okay. So so this station called Abano of this station uh, on Bottom Guan Trail was used was used from 1920 to 1944, uh, 1944. Mm -hmm. A different station had a different, uh, built in different time, but this one, this specific one is 1920 to 44. Um, the figure represents the location of the police station analyzed in this study. And this is the best uh, preserved in the trail, in the Baton Run Trail region. So you can see uh, the main structure is really preserved really well, and the right hand side is the golden tree for, uh, for the state and the family. And so we draw the archaeologists, so they draw the map, and here's the structure in the middle of the police station, which is the very well preserved main structure. And the right hand side is the golden tree, and the left hand side, there are some of the foreign and armory region. Right, and here's our collaborator, um, Jet. He, he, he works at um, Boston University. And in the dorm region where that um, toilet is, um, this is their daily life region, so you find the toilet um, and says pool. And we, we, we sample some of the soil from the says pool. Right, and you can see, you, in order to get it, you have to, 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 to yeah, stretch your hand and take more sample from, from the feet. Right, okay, so here is how we analyze um, the samples. Um, okay, the sample of the cesspool, the sediment was air dried, and the subsample were taken with zero to point um, underwent desegregation using. Uh, pure water with uh, sodium phosphate. Uh, different level, different uh, analysis, but this is the, the method we used. Okay. Uh, it took about one hour until suspension was obtained. The sample was passing through uh, this series of micro sieves. This is the micro sieves. So you can see. the micro sieves and you can see the water flow uh, happening through from the top to, to the bottom and then we take the sediment from the, the third third sieves and we send it to uh, microscope observation and the last one there are some like the liquids we send we, we send for ELISA uh, test because some of the parasites are very small it's hard to take by the sieves so those bigger enough, such as, for example, 20 micrometers we would use from microscope. So then we found, okay, the identification of parasite, um, we, we also need to use one of the reference. This is the, uh, the reference that you can assess from the textbook or database. And we use the size morphology to uh, make, to, to do the 
identification to, to, to determine which type of parasite it is. Okay? And here's the result. The microscopy of the sediment identified the egg of ground worm and um, quick worms and neurotrimia as well. And the quick worm eggs, uh, the first one, a quick worm was identified by their lemon shape and brown smooth surface and the location of the two globe plugs and the dimensions also about right for big worms and same to uh, the one worm because the related cause the, the morphology and the size and, right so right um, so we, we, we interpret that the lifestyle and the diet of the Japanese uh, uh, colonial during the early 20th century uh, in Baton Guan can be examined through the parasitic analysis uh, of the sediment from the toilet in, in the police station. And quick one from one X will present at low concentration in this uh, toilet cesspool. Indicate that the colonist, uh, this policeman, Will, or and family were probably infected with low number of quick worm and wrong worms and often spread by eating food contaminated by uh, human feces. And Eurotrima species were identified at much higher concentration, it's about 100 uh, eggs per gram, uh, which was higher number compared to good one, um, wrong ones. Um, tri tri uh, Eurotrima species require snail, cricket, grasshopper as uh, intermediate host to in order to complete the life cycle, as you can see uh, the picture. Uh, the infection is transmitted when this uh, this insect host were eat were eaten by uh, definitely uh, hosts, such as cattle, humans, pigs, even camels. So, so retrima, the most common species, uh, this is the most uh, common species in East Asia. And a down the slope of uh, this species, retrima species, uh, are found in um, the ducks, uh, pancreatic ducks, and occasionally can be in the bio and small intestines. And several hu uh, human erythrima infection, species infection, has been reported as well um, in modern Japan, um, but never found archaeologically in East Asia. That's very interesting. And in China, the infection occur uh, less fre uh, frequently among uh, camel monkeys, and most of the, yeah, in, in Asian cattle. Okay. So, uh, we, our interpretations here uh, infer that um, those uh, uh, families um, or these men, uh, it is possible they, uh, they, they ate undercooked uh, cattle intestine that uh, contain uh, the retrima species eggs, and so they might have a pass through them on change in their own feces. And this might also indicate that because uh, infected after they ate uh, infected grasshopper or salads, the vegetable um, contain the soda lava, so it's remained in, 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 in the toilet. It is it is unclear that the, the police uh, contract the Eurotrima um, species, um, this disease in Japan. Um, but it's might possible they get they contract it, they get this disease in Japan and they migrate to Taiwan, or they contract it, they infect with the disease locally in the northern region. Um, so this is uh, the, the, our study about the life of those people who use this latrines, uh, this place station in the very big mountain during the time of the place station. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, to all our three speakers. At this point, may I invite uh, Nikki to make a few comments? Hi everyone, my name is Nikki. I'm from the Sin Health Duquesne with Global Health Physician. I'm a public health physician. And so all this is very interesting for me. Um, so I think we really went through a really journey across time uh, here from the 1920s Taiwan uh, all the way to the formation of the WHO and after the post World War II and in the modern day AI machine learning. So it's really <laughs> you know, from the past to the future. I thought what really struck me was how from each talk we see how global health and global health security, which is how infectious diseases are, are framed in the modern time, goes from a very global outlook from the empires, uh, you know, empires and colonial powers down to a global association of uh, free nations to the national and regional offices, which Sandra mentioned are increasingly more relevant and powerful all the way down to really putting the power in individuals' hands. How can individuals participate in this thing called global health security? And I thought that was really interesting to see how it's shifting to the individual. And especially because, especially for infectious disease, the relationship between an individual and the state is often adversarial when it comes to infectious disease. The word infection often comes with the word control, controlling bodies controlling movements, controlling behaviors. So it's very rare you really see an individual uh, empowered in that relationship when it comes to infectious disease especially. Uh, when we're talking in diabetes, we're very like, yeah, empower, empower the patient, empower the individual. But in infectious diseases, we often ask the individual to sacrifice to the agenda of the state, of the global agenda. So I thought it was interesting if we can continue to see that shift in dynamic over time, where they can really ever veer towards the individual in, in infectious diseases. And even if we are controlling, uh, for what are we controlling? Are we controlling to make military conquests uh, of Taiwan or other countries more efficient? Are we controlling to really improve the health and livelihood of the people in the country? Are we controlling to improve a certain individual's life prospects in the future. So control will always be there when it comes to infectious disease, but the question is, for what reason are we controlling? And can there be any global health security without individual human security? I think this is a fundamental question. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, at this point, uh, I would like to open up to all the participants here. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you're most welcome to come forward. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Gumi from the Israel City in India and in the world. But uh, I'm, one of the interesting things of, of the, the first speaker said that. Uh, because of the one of the failure of the media and education in the past is due to the top down approach. So why you are saying that it is top down? And now we are also talking about the media education in the 2050. So so what the ratio should do is become the button up to be the sensible education like the small market education. So um, thank you, sir. Um, so uh, so I think the malaria eradication program of the 1950s uh, was put in the hands from within the WHO headquarters uh, uh, of a relatively small group of officials who had previously carried out research on malaria control, actually again in Sri Lanka, in the forests of Sri Lanka, with Rockefeller Foundation money. And they've done a lot of interesting research, and they have proven that that research was effective because they transferred it effectively uh, to the reconquest of Burma. Basically, the Allied armies benefited from that research. And, and historians like Mark Harrison have pointed out that one of the bases uh, for, for the 
Allied victory in, 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 in the retaking of Burma, but also Southeast Asia generally um, uh, from Japanese control, um, uh, was because the Allied anti-malaria uh, um, uh, um, control programs amongst their troops were more effective than what the Japanese forces could do in relation to the disease. So, so the, the, the military victory in the Pacific was just not down to weapons, but also more inferior, uh, 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 to better uh, malaria control programs. So, so, so when the WHO started, there was a recognition that this scientific research had helped the Allied cause in a major way. DDT was the magic bullet uh, in this story um, uh, and, and, and was presented as such through endless pro wartime propaganda films. All this material and all this sort of discussion about the power of DDT, the power of you know, how to spray, um, was uh, tested again in Italy after the Second World War. And there's again fascinating historical work by Randall Packard and by Socrates Litsios who point out that there are these mass DDT spraying campaigns in islands like Sardinia and southern Italy, which again yield results. Uh, they also point out that one of the reasons these campaigns are run is not because the Italian government particularly believes in malaria eradication, but because the Italian government is worried about the rise of communist power in Italy, and they, what they want to do is that all the soldiers that are demobilizing, they put them to work on the malaria eradication program, so they have jobs and they're connected to the state, and, and therefore less likely to fall under communist influence. But it is presented as uh, a follow-up chapter to malaria eradication. So again, there are very good data sets arising from Italy in, in relation to malaria eradication. So the wartime evidence and the Italian evidence is then used to justify the creation of a small Rockefeller, the old Rockefeller from the team, which then tries to um, use that same model globally and proposes it to all countries of the world where malaria is a problem. Now, in a situation where Ceylon, now Sri Lanka and India at that time did not produce DDT, it creates a, a, a relationship of dependence, which creates unhappiness in those government circles, but they sort of sign on to it because it's sort of the World Health Assembly agrees that malaria eradication is, um, is, is, is a priority. But whilst agreeing the agreement and saying, OK, we'll try these models, there is also opposition from the ground up, where there's attempts to adapt. And when those attempts to adapt fail, there's a lack of cooperation because it is seen as an imposed model. The difference in smallpox eradication was India signs on to smallpox eradication program, but rather than Geneva headquarters telling them, okay, now this is the model we want you to adapt, they recognize that there are different vaccinating systems already in place in India's different states. So what they ask India, is that you tell us, you know, ultimately our goal is to get 70% people vaccinated. You tell us how we can help that process along. So what is very striking is a very different process in between 1960 and 65. The Indian government is allowed, it is just given the money, but it is allowed to run a series of pilot programs in different parts of India where local administrators and local scientists do a series of experiments, some work, some don't. But they then use the model that comes out of the locally run pilot program to then define what happens in India in the nationwide smallpox eradication program. So the model is very different. 
And there is opposition to that as well. There will always be political competition and opposition in complex political structures. But no one in here could then say that this is an imposed system because this was a system based on evidence drawn from India. So this was not, uh, as some Indian administrators would say, that why should we work to a model developed in Sardinia? Makes no sense. India is not Sardinia. So that indigenization of data collection, pilot projects, helps communicate ideas. Um, so I think that was the crucial difference. And again, you're absolutely right. The talk of malaria eradication is starting. And I think history holds a lot of warnings about not trying to impose top down unless you connect society and wide range of expertise in this 21st century globalized world, there will be opposition. Just look at what's happening now with vaccine hesitancy. You see, the tracking is not happening. I wish they were talking to your team more and tracking the various things that are being said against vaccines. Even multilingual research is not being done. At most, they are tracking English-speaking criticisms of vaccines. When I talk to uh, my government colleagues in capitals or WHO, and I ask them, OK, uh, have you been following vernacular WhatsApping? Or, uh, you know, what are the fears? They don't know. At one level, is a question of resources. But it's also, at another level, a failure to engage local partners to get multilingual intelligence that you can then use to counter anti-vaccinationist uh, uh, propaganda. So I think, we, you know, Professor May's work, again, holds, I think, very serious warnings uh, to those who are planning malaria eradication now, prepare, engage socially, politically, administratively, before you launch into a global program. A global program cannot be run without nations and subnational governments. So does that answer what you were asking? Thank you. So Mr. Chair, hi, please. I'm Ben Rolf, uh, CEO of the uh, Asia Pacific Leaders and Mayor Alliance. I wanted to follow up on a, on a related issue, which is around uh, the same topic, which is do you think um, we actually now have the leadership capacity within the global health architecture to assist to achieve something like small cost eradication? You know, I'm a, a member of the Commission on, on Atlantic Commission on Malaria Eradication. And the backstory to that is that Bill wants to eliminate malaria. Right? And that Bill didn't think he was going to get it through WHO. So Bill ensured there was a commission of experts that would definitely agree that eradication was uh, feasible. And so, you know, in a sense, we see a breakdown of WHO's authority and people going outside that system. And if I relate our own experience of working with men and others to get heads of government to agree to eliminate malaria in Asia, we didn't work through WHO, we went straight to heads of government through the East Asia Summit mechanism because we realized we needed more senior leadership and also that WHO is fractured across the region. Absolutely. And you mentioned uh, you know, vaccine issues, adherence, and so in a sense, we, we've lost authority, maybe, I'm interested in your views, we've lost authority in terms of the superstructure and we've kind of lost authority in terms of the community engagement and leadership, for example, on vaccines. Do you, are we kind of losing the initiative, do you think? So I'll answer that in my personal capacity because I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm saying this due to my association with WHO. I don't get paid by WHO. My, um, I work in an unpaid capacity as a University of York employee. So I wouldn't want University of York embarrassed by this either. So this is as a personal academic. You're absolutely right. And the and it, I think any uh, sharp analyst of global health will know what's happening within and outside the WHO. And I think the Gates Foundation is correct that there are other places <coughs> to uh, or Bill is correct or his advisors are correct perhaps in pointing out that you can talk to other centers of power to get an idea moving, right? Um, and I think the UN understands that 
And anyway, I mean, the whole point of starting the SDGs and things like that is that you don't just talk to the health ministry because in most governments, the health ministry has less power than maybe the finance ministry. So the whole point in sustainable development is to involve both finance and health. I mean, unless the people who are willing to commit finances commit to health, there will be no health. You know, it's all about making it different partnerships. My sense is that, uh, yes, alliances outside the WHO can be made, and then, but that will only be partially successful. This is why I'm speaking in a personal capacity. Not because I'm a propagandist for the WHO, but there are a lot of countries now who believe that WHO protects their rights more than the Gates Foundation. So you can make as many alliances as you want, but there will be a very large number of nation states who will choose to work with the WHO simply because they feel more empowered within the WHO. Bill and the Gates Foundation does give, doesn't give one country one vote. His advisors come from a very narrow intellectual educational base. When they write history of polio eradication, they presume to believe that the history of polio eradication can be written by hundred uh, by, by writing about 100 people who were once funded by the Gates Foundation. But polio eradication is global. For 100 Gates Foundation people, there were 100,000 national workers. So truly global history. So national representatives are very, very aware of that. So they find, especially the current WHO, unlike the previous WHO regime, very empowering. It's one country, one vote. Tedros is actually moving power into the countries, which hasn't happened for about, well, under at least the last two director generals. So, yes, the foundation can talk to national reps and develop coalitions that support malaria. But countries that are again feeling empowered within the World Health Assembly and the WHO are unlikely to blindly follow the lead of that group. So, I think diplomacy has to be very careful because if some countries feel they're being bounced into doing this because of economic dependence, because the health systems are dependent on Bill, as in Africa, Rwanda being a good example, they'll only collaborate to a point. Fear, dependence, only gets you that far. Friendship, democratic involvement, gets you the whole way. So I think Bill needs to sit down with some democratic, thoughtful diplomats who have a successful track record of multilateral international action. But I'm not convinced that's happening right now. Top down never works. He'll fail in India immediately. I mean, he might give a award to India's Prime Minister, which is happening very soon. India is a federal government structure, 30 states. He'll have to give awards to all the state ministers before he can hope to have any political influence in India. But someone needs to tell him that. So, you know, the, half of India's states are not ruled by the Prime Minister's party. They most probably oppose him for giving the Prime Minister an award. So, you know, there are political, social complexities that have to be understood. That's why nations, localities are very important. That's why what Professor May is doing is so important because as tracking is done in Sri Lanka, you start getting fine grain local level information, which is actually staggeringly important. So I think this may become a battleground because under Tetros, I don't think WHO is going anywhere. Financially, they're under trouble always have been, especially with the American, current American president not giving the money that WHO needs from him. But, um, but importantly, other countries are stepping in to fill the gap. India has stepped in to fill the gap, uh, TB funding gap. So the signs are there that this is not necessarily an organization in crisis. This is an organization in flux. And my 
I would think that any global funder would be in dangerous territory to, to confuse that flux with weakness. I don't think they're weak because ideologically they are stronger. And that ideology is an ideology of internationalism and empowerment. So let's see what happens. It's fascinating. The great thing is I'm not funded by any of these people, so I can just sit back and see what's happening. But does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Peter, I'm not funded by AIDS at the moment. Unfortunately, I'm not funded by WHO either, so <laughs> relatively. Um, I actually disagree with both of you. I think this top down, bottom up is actually uh, secondary. For polio, you had the tools, you had a vaccine which was working. For malaria, you didn't. You relied on an insecticide and a single drug and resistance.